Um, hi everybody, I'm here to present about uh, the Freenet project. Uh, first, I need to gather some uh, demographic information from the audience before I allow you access to uh, my information. All right, um, who all in here is a male between the ages of 18 and 24? <laughs> all right. Um, <clears throat> uh, who all here has no idea what Freenet is or thinks that it's a free internet uh, provider? All right. All right, good. I'm, I'm presenting an Uber hack source, so I don't have to cover so many details. Okay. Um, all right. So, um, Freenet, anonymous distributed um, file sharing uh, network. Um, this is um, my little demonstration I made with uh, crayons. Uh, props out to Griff John for the photoshopping. Um, so anyway, so here's uh, I have some vacuous animations which uh, don't really give any real information, but they, they kind of give you a general idea of how it works. And then I'm just going to talk, and I don't have any PowerPoint slides or anything. Uh, this is all done in Flash, because the people on the Freenet mailing list, uh, they were really into Flash. And I was all like, hey, well, you know, I could do this in HTML, but I'll use Flash to waste some CPU cycles. <laughs> so, um, all right, so this is the Freenet, um, the Freenet network. All right, now this is, um, this is Ian. Uh, Ian is a uh, Ian Clark. He's a 40-year-old um, uh, accountant from uh, England, and he's uh, he's in China. All right, and his um, his node is the Pirate Radio Zero Knowledge Network. That's that's his node because each node is really like a network of nodes. All right. Now he wants to get some uh, some information which he can't get in China. You know, some uh, some dissident political documents like the like the Zapatista manifesto, something like that. I couldn't find any good uh, pictures of Zapatista manifestos, so I'm using this picture instead. Okay. <laughs> so this I just found this on the net. This picture it just uh, uh, represents the Zapatista manifestos. Okay. So. <laughs> Now, this information is stored over here on the far node, um, which is a network run by the uh, KRAD Elite Toronto Hacksaw's Eternity Router. Okay, so, and now I'm going to route a request through the network. This is a very long request. Uh, it's, you know, this is only if uh, the, it's way on the other side of the network. Okay, so here's a little request animation I drew. Isn't that, isn't that spiffy? Oh, very spiffy. Okay, and now... There's Britney being cached all throughout the network. I'm sorry, the Zapatista manifesto is being cached all throughout the network. Isn't that a beautiful picture? The network is full of Zapatista manifestos. Now, if he makes if he makes another another request, it's only it's only like one hop away down down the network. Okay, so that was fun. Now, here from Ian's perspective, here's the network, and this is really where a lot of the anonymity. Um, comes from in the basic infrastructure is Ian knows about three nodes. These are his friends that you know are running nodes, and he does a request, and he waits a very long time, and then he gets it back, and that's it. Whereas you know with like um, things such as Nutella and Napster, he would gain more information about the network by doing this request. You as a node, you do a request to the network, you don't gain any information um, except maybe some timing information about how long it gets to get back, but you don't know where it was originally from because if he does another request, it's only one hop away now. Okay. So that's all my flashy Photoshop-y things. Now here are some much simpler um, things. This is a network uh, I generated um, algorithmically very fast. No one would actually have a network like this. I don't mean this to be a convincing uh, example. But uh, so we have this person here, and they're inserting some information to the network. Um, and there it's cached upon a bunch of nodes. What do you assert? It's cached upon a bunch of nodes. Then you have uh, this person over here request the information, and now it's cached upon a bunch of more nodes. Um, and then, you know, like that first node that drops the information off because no one's requesting it anymore. <clears throat> and then, you know, someone over here um, does a request, and then so on, until eventually, as people keep requesting the information, you can no longer tell where it really, where it really originally came from, because there's no, uh, you know, uh, the uh, you could say, for instance, that you can still trace the information back to its original source by the distribution of the information throughout the network. You could say, okay, well, because the information is distributed this way, I bet it came from here. But with all these different people requesting it, it gets all messed around, all chaotically, and so. Um, from a, a, a later state of the network, it's hard to trace back to where it originally came from. Now, of course, if you have someone uh, looking at the, uh, the network from the very beginning, eavesdropping on the network, then it's a lot easier to tell because, well, you saw when they originally inserted it, so therefore you know where it was inserted from. That's kind of obvious. But 
All right. So, um, and I have another um, slide thing that I'll get to later. So anyway, so my presentation is basically about different attacks that people have come up with to attack Freenet. Um, some of them are just like, every time I talk about Freenet, someone has the flooding it with a bunch of junk data idea, for instance. And um, I'm going to talk about why these um, attacks, we don't think they're going to work. Now, there's no way really to tell until we get a really big network and we do all the tests, but theoretically, a lot of these attacks probably shouldn't work. And I'm going about this so that um, you all can come up with much more clever attacks that we can um, defend against. Um, for instance, that guy who was um, giving out um, <coughs> IP addresses of people that had gotten stuff on Napster and Nutella, uh, he says that he thinks that he knows a way to find out who's publishing stuff on Freenet and that the um, he won't tell us because, of course, we'd fix it. And he trusts that we have um, such hubris that we will think that it's perfect and we won't, um, we won't fix it. And so, uh, you know, um, maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. I don't have any of this. But uh, I figure you guys are all very smart and you can come up with some very clever attacks. Okay. So the first attack um, that you could do on a network is uh, denial of service. Well, you can denial of service any node just like you denial of service any machine. You know, you can, you can just do an attack on it, fill up its bandwidth, and it'll go down. But that doesn't really matter because um, you can always root around to some other node. So any particular node going down doesn't matter. And that's why we have the anti slash dot effect um, because the node that originally gave the information, um, it doesn't get the request rooted to it. Like if you do a request from down here, um, for the information, it's going to go like here, whereas the information started up over there, so that's not even getting any more requests. So, um, so denial of servicing a particular node doesn't really matter. Um, if someone depends on that node to get their information, then okay, they're, they're screwed, but that's just one person. The network as a whole doesn't go down. Okay. So then there's two kinds of attacks you can do on the entire network. There's um, uh, bandwidth attacks and um, disk space attacks, because you know it's all shared bandwidth, it's all shared disk space. Bandwidth attacks, you can... Um, when you send a request into the network, you know, it goes several hops through the network. So you can um, do just a whole lot of inserts, just keep on inserting and inserting and inserting or requesting and requesting and requesting, whichever you want to do. And all of these messages will go through out the network and you're like, okay, well, if you, if you do that enough, then that's going to uh, bog down the network with all of this traffic and, and no one will be able to use it. Um, kind of like Nutella, you know, when you have more than 2,000 users. They have that, that problem. Um, well, the thing about that is that, um, well, there's several things, all right. Um, first of all, when you um, insert something into the network, it gets rooted um, in this, um, sorry, routed in this, um, in this smart way. Oh, let, me, let me show those slides about the, the smart routing. Okay. So here's, this is, uh, I know this is kind of hard to follow. Um, I talked about this at the Berkeley conference and nobody could really follow what I was saying and uh, email me if you want a more detailed description. But um, every, every node has an ID. Um, whenever you insert something into the network, it also has an ID. Uh, all right, so um, you're inserting a file with uh, um, ID 49 and you just happen to insert to this node that has ID. That's like the node that you know about, right? Now, the way the IDs are um, come up with is you take um, the either the, you, you, whenever you insert a file, you insert it um, twice. You insert it under the, the, uh, the hash of the descriptive name, like uh, uh, freenet slash readme is you know a file that you can get. So you hash that. You have that value. That's a value. You also insert it under you hash the um, contents of the file and so you insert that. So now you have a way to if you know the name of the file freenet slash readme you can get it because you can hash that. That's the key that you get it from the network. If you have ever seen the file before, then you can you have the content hash so you can get the same file again. That's a security thing. So anyway, so you um, so you insert it to node 8 and then node 8 has to determine which node to send it to, 37 or 13. Well, um, it just goes with whatever's closest. Um, so 49 is closest to 37, so it roots it over there. And then um, out of 45 and 50, um, it's closer to 50, and so it roots it there. All right. So that's how, that's how it will propagate through the network if it has value 49. Well, um, the reason that this is smart and neat is that um, nodes, uh, files will tend to cluster. Now, they don't cluster based on content. They're based on the hash of the descriptive key, which has nothing to do with the distribution of the, of the names of the content. So it's, 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 uh, it's a purely mathematical sort of clustering. So if you insert on node 1, it'll go there, and then it'll go 19, and it'll go, and oh, look, it found 50 again. They, they, they went to the same place. Um, isn't that nice? And so, um, so anyway, so the thing is, if you insert a whole bunch of different 
keys, and like you, you generate a whole bunch of random keys, and you insert, 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 insert all these random keys. They won't all go to the same place. They'll all go to different places. One will take a left here, and then a right here. One will take a right here, and then a left there, and etc. So the uh, denial of service um, that you're trying to do on the network will um, diffuse such that you're really only doing um, a denial of service with a really strong, you know, effect on a local area, like a node, and maybe the nodes around it. So that's still not going to take down the network. Um, it, w it might, uh, if you had a lot of people doing this and their like, zones of denial of service interlocked, it would be a more powerful, easy to do denial of service than denial of servicing every single node in the network. That's true. But you're not going to take down the entire network by just hooking up to a single node and doing this. Um, now, you can, of course, if you have enough resources, you can connect to enough nodes, then you can, you can do a massive denial of service. But that's, I mean, even without this sort of uh, um, routing, if you uh, had enough resources, you could just take down all the nodes. I mean, if you have enough resources. Um, and we're just counting on the fact that no one has that much resources for all of the different countries that nodes are at um, and can find all the nodes, etc. Okay, so then there's um, storage. Um, um, things. All right, so uh, you can insert a whole bunch of junk so that all the nodes disks fill up, and um, the the way that we um, deal with disk filling up is that you get rid of any information which hasn't been um, requested recently, because then only the most popular information is around. A lot of people they're like, oh well, you know, but I think that we should keep unpopular information around too. Um, and I say, well, then you should join Freenet with some other things such as Freehaven, which you can look at at freehaven.net, um, which is a very nice um, project, which keeps information around forever, and you just use Freenet for distributing, because Freenet has this nice caching, anti slash dot effect sort of thing, and another level of anonymity on top of Freehaven. Anyway, so, so yes, you can fill up the disk spaces, and all of the unpopular information will fill out. However, you can't really do that in a... Um, in a very quick denial of service sort of way, because what happens is when you insert something, it's at the bottom of the list, and it doesn't get promoted up in the list until um, you request it. Well, so if you make a whole bunch of inserts, they're all going to just push each other off the bottom of the list, because they can't push anything um, um, off higher up, because you'd have to, you know, they haven't requested. Okay, so that gives you this, this new idea. You can do a combined insert request attack where you insert a whole bunch of content and then you request that content and you move it up in the stack and then um, eventually the node's completely filled with your bad content that nobody wants and all of the things that people are trying to get on in the network anymore. Um, that will only work um, if you have, um, you see, the problem with stopping that sort of attack is that it's hard to tell the difference between that and legitimate use. Legitimate use, people insert stuff and then they request stuff. I mean, what can you do about that? Um, there's two ways to deal with that. One of the ways is to uh, limit the frequency with which you um, are able to send messages to a particular node. The node's like, I'm sorry, you're spamming me, obviously, so I'm not going to let you send any more messages for a while. Um, I don't know how good an idea that works. Uh, I don't really like um, coding things into the nodes to make them try to anticipate user behavior and uh, not allow anomalous user behavior because that's kind of a that's kind of a cheap hackish way to do it. I don't know if it'll actually work all that well in practice, but that's just an idea that people have come up with. The other thing is that uh, since it just looks like normal um, user traffic to some extent, it's it's somewhat a question of do you have the resources to make more bogus traffic than there is legitimate traffic? If you have that in general, then you're, we're pretty much screwed. If you know you have that resources to just be a million users, then I don't see how any system could really deal with that. Um, there is the idea of um, uh, micropayments like the Mojo Nation project that's that's kind of there um, and you should check them out at uh, mojonation.com I think yes uh, net mojonation.net oh, that's one correct me um, what no they presented yesterday but um, but you can check them out anyway okay so um, so yes so there's uh, there's the micropayment idea um, we're uh, anti-capitalist anarchists, generally, so that idea doesn't go over so well on the mailing list. I'm not an anti-capitalist anarchist myself, but everybody else is. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe we'll get around to that someday. We have a lot of other issues that we need to work out um, before, before we get to that point. Um, okay, so... Okay, so then that leaves um, information-based attacks, which is you put a bunch of stuff in the network that looks really appealing and people really want to get it, but it's really not what they're looking for. the, um, I forget what someone called that attack. Um, oh, that's the Pat Boone attack, right? That's where you, uh, you take your Pat Boone MP3s and you say, Britney Spears MP3s, and people download them and they're like, oh my God, and they're scarred for life because they, they had to listen to Pat Boone. Um, 
And uh, okay, so there's that attack. Well, that's really that's really um, an issue of trust. Who do you trust? Do you trust stuff you get from random people? Do you trust that um, you know if something says what it is that it really is what it is? Uh, well, no, that's dumb. I mean, why would you do that? So um, the, what we have is um, digital signatures. You can digitally sign any piece of information. That doesn't mean you put the information in there. That just means you found it and you say, okay, this is what it is, or it is good, or whatever. You, you can interpret the signature to mean whatever you want it to mean. You sign some things, you put them in the network, people can get stuff, they can determine whether it's good or whether it's bad, and if it's good, then they can put your signature on a list of signatures that know what's up, and then in the future you can filter and only get stuff signed by those people, or by a combination of people, etc. Um, yes? Ah, uh, well, now is your rights not anonymous? It's pseudonymous. Um, if you want, uh, you know, true anonymity, then you can't have trust. That's just how it is. If you want to, I mean, the pseudonym. <clears throat> that's true. If you have, if you publish a lot of things under the same, um, the same uh, key, uh, then I'm sorry, under the same uh, digital signature, then if anyone busts you for one of those, then they've busted you for all of them because obviously you had to have the key to sign the digital signature. Uh, otherwise, what's the point? So yeah, that's uh, that's an issue. It's always a trade-off between trust and anonymity, and uh, I think that there should be kind of a sliding scale. You participate as anonymously as you want. You trust people as much as you want. And such. So, um, so that's the, the basic solution to the um, the information attacks is, you know, building a, a trust model and that sort of thing. Um, let me think. I think that's basically all I had to go over. So um, I'll take uh, questions. Um, yeah, you're there. Um, no, it actually, it does, when you first insert it, uh, it goes to a number of nodes um, on the insert. Is that just one pop away from the node insertion? Um, you, um, oh yeah, that's something I forgot to mention. Whenever you do any kind of message, an insert or a request, you get to determine how many nodes you want to search. Like, with an insert, you determine how many nodes you want it to try to propagate to. Not that it necessarily can propagate to all those nodes with this. You get to say how far you want it to try to go out. And with a request, you get to determine how many nodes you want to search before you give up. So if you do, that's a hops live. If you do insert with a hops live of like five, then it goes to maybe five nodes, um, approximately. It's probabilistic rather than deterministic, actually. It, uh, like the higher the, the, the hops live, the more likely it's going to keep uh, replicating before it, it eventually stops. Um, um, there's a limitation. Everything, all the configuration is done on a node-by-node -node basis. Like, for instance, the, the idea that you get rid of unpopular data. Well, if your node doesn't want to get rid of unpopular data, okay, fine. Don't get rid of unpopular data. That's fine. That sort of thing. If you want to only accept connections from people from New Jersey, okay, only accept connections from people from New Jersey. Uh, right, right. I'm sorry. I was getting that. Um, so, yes. So, there's a, there's a maximum hops to live um, dependent on your node. Your node, when messages pass through it, it can... Like, you know, chop off the hop slip at a certain value or whatever it wants to do. Yes? Um, I don't know too much about the details of it, but these identifiers are based on hashing information uh, pretty much, right? Yeah. What would it say? What would happen if I say put a row one of those that advertise lots of, I know, the, the route, or not the route, but I'm the nearest hop to. All these hashes. Ah, oh, right, right. I see what you're saying. You're saying is, um, like, what if the nodes get to choose their own identifiers? Is that what you're saying? So they're assigned identifiers? Yes. Um, well, they're assigned identifiers by the... All right. Um, this is... The, the way the nodes are assigned identifiers, I came up with this on a whim, so maybe it's a bad idea. No one, no one's actually analyzed it yet, but um, the way that the nodes come up with identifiers... Well, it's all relative. Your node determines what the identifiers are for the nodes that it knows about. The way that I have them assigning these identifiers is by taking the hash of the address of the node. Um, and this is good because it, it adds to this subtle um, clustering effect, but um, you know, it's, it's still, yes? But it's still kind of, it, does, it doesn't alleviate the, hi, I'm the one that's right next to the one that gets it. Uh, yes, it does, because you, you as the evil node, don't get to choose your identifiers. The node that's talking to you chooses your identifier by hashing your IP. And you can't choose your IP. And even if you could choose your IP, um, you can't choose an IP, um, you can't figure out what your IP is going to, to hash to. Um, except you could, like, choose a whole bunch of IPs, get their hashes, and then keep doing that until you found a hash that you wanted, but that, that would be breaking the hash. Okay, so it's arbitrary. Right, right. It's the it's 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 uh yeah it's it's it doesn't it doesn't mean anything. It's just a mathematical question. Yes. How does one search for that top of the exact name of the file? 
Ah, you can't. You can't search freedom without knowing the exact name of the file. Um, searching is something that we have on our to-do list. It's a massive, massive problem doing searching in a truly anonymous way that doesn't hurt efficiently, uh, efficiency. Um, we've pretty much, I think we've got it worked out, um, and it's, it's going to be coming up. Um, after we get our beta out, uh, the, the new version of Freenet with a lot more security, a lot more encryption, that sort of thing, huge leaps of improvement is coming out next week. And then we have a few more versions, and then we beta, and then we add things like searching, updating documents, um, mix networks, that sort of thing that are really huge, huge issues. Um, yes? Um, you mean uh, so that um, like there's this like snowballing effect like happened with uh, Phil Zerman's PGP key? Is that what you're kind of talking about? Like so that so that the files get bigger and bigger and bigger is is that the problem you're talking about? Well, I mean, people can sign it, but it's like, do you trust their signature? I mean, it's, it's a matter of, um, signatures don't mean anything unless you trust the person that signed it. So it's, it's a matter of, uh, if you make a bunch of pseudonyms and sign a bunch of files, then it, it still doesn't really matter. Um, yep. Um, file name, conf I don't understand the question. Could you well, it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. And then sitting over here, I am anti-Japanese. Right. Uh-huh. And I see this file going around, and you know, pop there and stop starting my cache. So I now get from the same name. Ah, all right. Name collisions. All right. The way the name collisions ha happen is when you insert a file, you determine how many how many nodes you want to propagate to. It goes and it checks a path, like if you give it a hop slip of five. It goes five nodes out, and it sees, okay, is there something with the same name? If, there, if it ever hits something with the same name, then it... It uh, not only does it not allow for the um, for the thing you're trying to insert to be inserted, but it copies the file it finds all the way back to your node. So now, if you insert it, there's an instant collision. Um, so if you're trying to do this kind of attack where you insert something on the same name, you have to you have to really weigh it. All right, I want to get as far as I can because if you only put it one node in, then well, the other files all over the network, no one will ever find your version. Whereas if you put it a whole lot of things in, then you're going to sabotage yourself. Um, yeah, an space is constantly decreasing, but it's a it's a 160-bit SHA-1 hash of that, so that's a really big uh, namespace. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Talk in person. Oh, yeah. What's the control for someone just to make like a worm that basically works with that hash numbering oh. thing that I'm still trying to figure out? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, um, a worm would mean that the thing that you have has to be somehow executed or something. A static file can't be a worm. And uh, no, no code is executed. Um, yes, if you have a, uh, a, an exploit on the, um, on, the, on the node, then, you know, then, yeah, you could build a worm, but you could build a worm with, uh, with anything in that case. Um, yeah, the guy with the hat. Yes, yes. I forgot to talk about evil nodes. Yeah, that's a very good, uh, a very good problem. Yeah, um, evil nodes. That's the thing that we haven't done a lot of research on. I'd really like to see some people write some really evil nodes. In fact, I, um, I'm thinking of sponsoring an, an evil node contest. That if you write a really evil node, I'll give you "I'm an enemy of free speech" T-shirt. I think that'd be cool. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll work on that. And Hillary Rosin, she says we're next, by the way. Um, uh, yeah, that guy right there. So, are you streaming the case ID, or how do you handle dynamic ID? Uh, well, you know, if you have a, a dynamic DNS address, then then you're good. If you have uh, your IP key switching all the time, then that means that people will have references to your node, and they'll go down, and um, you know, then that'll be bad. And uh, so you, you shouldn't change your IP a lot. I mean, it won't really make a difference. It just means that um, people will be trying to talk to you. You won't be there. They'll forget about you, and then you'll pop up. And but you see, because the nodes are all currently, um, you know, like anonymous nodes, they're all like one is the same as the other. Then uh, in, it doesn't really matter if you keep switching around, except that uh, people keep trying to talk to you. Won't be there. It'll be kind of obnoxious. But since it's it's a program doing it, it won't really be annoyed. Yes? <laughs> that 
That's that's a that's a really um, interesting idea. Everyone always talks about this. So I was like, we should make some bridges. In fact, I saw the Mojo, Mojo Nation demo, uh, like not demo, but a presentation. I was all like, wow, free that Mojo Nation gateway. That would be badass. But um, no one's actually working on it because all these projects have kind of insular developers. There are a few people that are on, on two projects. Uh, someone just posted on Freshmeet.net. They were like, hey, we should integrate. Freenet into Mozilla, so that whenever you get something, it'll automatically look in Freenet. If it's not there, it'll get it from the web, put it in Freenet. That way we have this nice caching thing, and we never have to worry about the slash dot effect again if you're using Mozilla and you have the Freenet plugin in. And I was like, that's a really great idea, and if there are any Freenet Mozilla developers, then you should work on that. The core developers, um, we're really busy. We have uh, a lot of issues to work out. This is a really hard problem, so we're not going to work on any of that. You want to, you want to, it's in Java. I know everyone hates that. If you want to port it to C, okay, port it to C. You want to port it to C++, someone's working on it. You want to port it to a uh, scheme, all right, you go for it. We're all for it, but we don't have time. Uh, yes, with the blue hair. Oh yeah, we've been open source from the very beginning. Everything's free. We have a distributed um, uh, development model. Um, like, you know, people are like, Brandon, you know, you need to fix the web page. And I'm like, dude, I don't even know who wrote the web page. Okay. Um, I just presented a paper that someone else wrote. It's it's all we've got. Um, all of our, uh, our our logos and things are open source. Oh, this is. Uh, I have Freenet T-shirts, by the way. If anybody wants some, they're not free because I I paid for them. And please, someone at least buy one so I can f afford cab fare back to my hotel. They're ten dollars. Anyway. But uh, like you know, this logo—it's by some guy. His name's Rick. He's pretty cool. He has a lot of cool logos. Um, so yeah, we're we're GPL'd. Uh, we were thinking about assigning our copyright to the Free Software Foundation so that when uh, um, the RIA sues us, um, that that they won't sue us; they'll sue the Free Software Foundation. <laughs> And uh, that was an idea, but we had too many people that had submitted patches that we didn't know who they were, so th they wouldn't let us do it, I don't think, because we'd have to get like all those people to sign things and all that stuff. Okay, uh, you with the yeah, hi. Hey, what's up? Yeah, it's Dan. Uh, yeah. Also with namespace Twitter, since you have a cross site hash and you have a file name, yeah. The fat attack doesn't work with the content hash, correct? Exactly. Content hashes are unique to every file and are immutable. Similarly, could you use that to solve your namespace collisions? Well, you, you could, but the thing is, um, then you're just moving the namespace to a different problem. For instance, um, instead of like sending the name to the Freenet network and getting it back, you could go to a list of things that have names, and then they link to content hashes. That's fine, but then how do you get the list of names? Well, you know, you could put that in by content hash, and that's fine, but how do you get that content hash? And uh, we... I, all right, I am not okay with the idea of you having to use some other thing like the web or user or something in order to get your keys because those are all very censorable mediums and we're trying to stop censorship. And the only real way to stop censorship is to make it so you only have to use uncensorable mediums. And um, so the real solution here is that uh, you have to um, event you have to start with a name and then from then you can go on to like indexes of content hashes and it's all very secure. You don't have namespace problems. Yeah? When you're choosing the signature that you trust, Mm -hmm. um, do you choose which ones, or do you say, because these people signed a document that I like too, I'll trust all of these things? Because that would open up the attack that some guy signs a good document mm -hmm. and a bad document. Or Lots of good documents, lots right. of um, well, implementation-wise, we haven't actually integrated into the client the thing where you check signatures. There are signatures, and there are they, the nodes support them. But the client, which allows you to determine, like filter things by signatures, we haven't actually implemented that yet. That's coming out in the next release. When I'm talking about Freenet, I'm not talking about what we currently have. I'm talking about our design in the near future. Um, well, you know, that's really a user interface. In fact, clients might do that differently because that's totally a user interface issue. Um, and uh, yeah, I would think that what you would just do is that when you get the file, you see what signatures are on it, and then you choose which ones you want. And it would be dumb to choose them all. So don't, don't do that. Um, now, of course, that means that uh, if you find a file with a bunch of signatures, that means that you can't really trust it. But what you can do is you find um, a bunch of different files, and you like you find the intersection of signatures. And yeah, that's a very sticky problem. You should get on the mailing list. We'll talk about it. Oh, you are on the mailing list. Cool. Uh, what's your name? Do I know you? What? Uh, there's a David. Oh, oh, dude, I forgot. That was my other demographic question. How many of you are on the Freenet mailing list? Hey, cool. I was all sad because I couldn't find anybody that was on the Freenet mailing list, and I, I wanted to meet some people. Um, come say hi after the thing, so I'll know who you are. Uh, yeah, what's up? Storage space. Scour is a good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Yeah, people are doing that right now, actually. It's really funny because we're, we're, we're alpha, right? I mean, we don't, uh, maybe we're even pre-alpha. We don't even have all the features in, in yet. You know, we're just, we, we got a couple releases until we go beta, and there's people that they just, they email me, they're like, um, I'm going to get a DSL line and a machine and a, like a 12 gig hard drive and donate it to Freedom. I'm like, thanks. That's great. Um, we're, we're upgrading our software next week. Maybe you want to wait till then because you got to install the new software. Um, uh, you there. Yes. Yeah, um, I've got a question about Paranoid Freenet, that was me. I was all like, we need to be more paranoid. They're all like, tch, tch. <laughs> Anyway, um, yeah, the, uh, all right, traffic analysis and your know, timing attacks, they're all part of traffic analysis. Traffic analysis, we have no defense for traffic analysis. If you have, um, all right, well, there is, you know, um, there's encryption, you know, between the nodes and all that sort of thing, and you don't know, um, the node that you're talking to you, unless you've been looking at it from the beginning of the network, you don't know what it's storing, so it's still very hard to tell, you know, what you're getting, but uh, there are still various traffic analysis attacks that, that we just don't defend against. Uh, people have been talking about putting, um, uh, oh yeah, hey, that was my, that was my other demographic question. Who knows what a Chamian mix node is? I was just wondering. Um, okay, so anyway, we were talking about putting um, uh, mix uh, nodes into every node so that everything would be all mixed networked and um, timing would be, but there is some uh, latency issues with having every single Freenet node be a mix node. I mean, there's inherent, that's what mix nodes do. That's part of what they do is they add latency. And that's not so, that's not so good when you're going through several, several hops. So um, what we kind of decided sort of, and uh, when I say we, uh, that doesn't mean that everybody agrees with me. Actually, we usually disagree. But um, uh, what we've decided is you use a mixed node to get into the Freenet network. That adds one, one hop of latency, and then you do all the Freenet network, blah, 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 and then you come back out of the Freenet, but that's two hops of latency. So instead of like 10 hops of latency, you have two in and out. And so we need a good, you know, mixed node in place. That's one of the pieces of the puzzle. The pieces of the puzzle are you need a mixed node to get into Freenet that solves timing, then you have Freenet that solves all the the other anonymity issues like publish anonymity, that sort of thing. Then you need a place where it can be permanently stored, such as Freehaven, and uh, then there'd be a nice, it'd be nice if there's a stegographic way to access it in the first place, because the, like the, the thing that the guy from Freehaven uh, brought up, I wish I could remember his name. Um, anyway, what he brought up is uh, the thing with anonymous uh, networks, the, the real test is, can they use it in China? China being a metaphor for places where they're going to kill you if they find out that you're doing something wrong. I don't know if they'll really kill you in China. I've never been to China. I don't mean to make the Chinese people mad. I'm just just a metaphor. Anyway, um, and so uh, and so um, you really need a steganographic way, and that's another piece of puzzle. But anyway, um, someone else was raised in their hand somewhere. Um, let's hear your question. You, I don't think you've had a question yet. Uh, how do you deal with uh, updates to content? Updates. Like, yeah. Yeah, we don't have updates yet. That's another thing that's on our post post 1.0 to do this because there's huge issues with efficiency and um, also with uh, you know security. There's also the update problem that uh, if you can make an update that you can destroy your file, that means someone can come with a gun to your head and say destroy your file. And um, we're going to make it updates where you can't actually destroy the original version. You can just put in a new version. Um, maybe. We're, we're kind of debating. But anyway, updates are a huge issue. Um, we really haven't gotten those figured out because of, uh, we just came up with a simulator. The simulator allows you to make a really big Freenet network and uh, test stuff on it. Um, and so that's where we're, because basically it came down to a point that we had two competing proposals and the two proposal authors were like, no, that's going to be bad. And the other guys, no, that's going to be bad. And so we need a, a simulator or something so that we can actually test it out. We just got that out. So that should be, that should be coming on up soon. Um, yep. Uh, with your uh, hopping to the yeah. That's when your uh, hops live runs out. Uh, you start with a hops live of like whatever you want it to be, and then um, and you're out. Well, it's uh, the, the hops live is probabilistic. Um, your your hops live uh, like if you start with um, you start with a five, you know, there's a pretty high percentage, and then you know, get a four, there's less percentage, three, and then one, there's a very tiny percentage, and then it keeps going down until eventually your uh, you know like probabilistically you, you, you stops. Uh, no, I, I, I made this up, uh, and so I, I presented this at Berkeley, and people were all like, I don't understand this, Brian. I'm like, um, I'm sorry, I don't have any slides. So I have some slides now, so it's better. But uh, yeah, nobody knows. Um, there, I mean, you don't have to root it this way. We could just like change the line of code, and it wouldn't be um, um, 
rooted this way. This is just, uh, it, it has this subtle clustering effect that I kind of like. But this is a thing that a lot more research needs to go into with a lot of mathematical sort of research, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, you're right there. Um, um, this one right here. Yes, if we were to hop one more time, it would hop to 37. Why is it to 49 and What do you mean? No, right now 49 is at 50. And so the next hop, it has to choose between 13, 19, and 37 from, from the 50 node. Uh, so you can't choose yourself when you're choosing the closest one. No, you, you, can't, you can't choose yourself because you're already there. You can't, you can't get an infinite loop because every message has a unique ID that if uh, you get a message with the same ID, then you say, I'm sorry, I've already had this message, and so you, it, it, avoids, it avoids loops. Although, you know, for anonymity reasons, uh, loops might actually be good. Crowds is a system which allows anonymous uh, web browsing, and it allows for loops. And, uh, but uh, for efficiency reasons, we don't allow loops. And um, let's see. Okay, you. There. Yes. Um, a, a client doesn't look like a node, and uh, it looks like a client. And when you your client talks to a node, it well, it, it it uses the same protocol, so it does look like a node. But at the same time, uh, you that's a big issue because uh, if you're running a client and you connect to some public node out there, right? That's evil, and they somehow tell by some kind of you know thing in the way that your your protocol looks as opposed to the standard protocol. They're like, hey, wait a minute, I know this. This is that node written. In, uh, this is that client written in Python. They now know that you're really inserting or requesting. You're not just rooting stuff for other people. You're really inserting or requesting. So you're busted. That's why everyone. Everyone should run a node on their local machine, and even if you only run it when you're actually leeching, you should still run a node because that gives you these anonymity properties that you can't get from running a client across the network. Um, the only reason that the node and the and the client are two separate programs is just it's a design thing. It's a lot cleaner to split the code. We could we could put it in one program, but they'd end up just running two separate threads. They're two separate programs. But you should always run a node on your local system, and also you should do it because if you're not giving any um, space to free net network, then you suck and you're a bad person. <laughs> yes, you publish your own node and then it publishes to other nodes and it looks just like a node because it is. It's pretty suave. Okay, um, way back there. Nodes behind firewalls. Um, all you have to do is you, you specify in your headers in the protocol, um, I want this to be a keep alive connection, don't, uh, don't drop it. And then you have to keep a connection open. And that's the only way to do it. We kind of had this idea for a while of uh, having it where you could be like, hey, you node, um, I'm going to connect a while later. Can you like store my stuff for me? But uh, that seemed like a really nasty sort of thing that bad people could do. Like, could you store these files for me that are illegal and I'll come by later to your house? Um, and bust you. So, um, so uh, I don't think we're going to do that. So yeah, basically, if you're behind a firewall, you have to keep a connection open, and then all the messages pass down the connection between you and a, and, a, and uh, whatever nodes you're talking to, and uh, that works fine. It's not very efficient, but hey, you're running behind a firewall. It's too bad. Okay. Okay, well, the, the centralized system we have for finding about other nodes, um, that's you go to a web page and it tells you what other nodes have logged on recently, that's not, that's not part of our system. That's just because, you know, if you want to use Freenet, you know, like right now, you've got to find out about some other nodes, and so we have this nice convenient bootstrapping testing that we know is evil, and it's not part of our system, it's just for testing. Um, you don't really need to find out about other nodes. With Intella, for instance, you find out about like a thousand nodes, because that's how their system works. It's a very flat network. Our network is much um, broader. You need to know about like five nodes. And so, you know, you got to find, like, you get, um, you know, you run, you get some public node that for some reason you trust. I don't know why you trust some public node. It's probably been compromised. But you can trust them. And you get, like, four of your friends to run nodes. And they connect to their friends. They connect to their friends. They connect to their friends. And then every now and then, you're like, okay, we ran out of people. And you connect one of your people to some untrusted public node. You're only exposing one person that way. Um, and then that's how you get the, 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 big, uh, the big network there. And uh, that's how it should work. And so you don't need to find out about other nodes. However, you can find out about other nodes in that when messages are passing through your system, there's an option that you can do when you first send that message to say, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a nice guy. Just tell everybody my address. Just let them know I'm here, you know, and I'll just talk directly with them now instead of all these layers of obscurity. I don't really know why you'd want to do that, but for some reason people keep asking for this. So we have this. If you want to broadcast your address to everyone in the world, you can set this thing and it will probabilistically broadcast your address. Sometimes your address will get overridden, sometimes it won't. That way, 
it's still hard to tell whether the, whether the information actually came from any particular node. But um, yeah, so you can find out about nodes that way, but you don't know who they are, and you can't trust them. So I don't know why you'd want to. But um, okay, oh, you over there. Yeah. What protections are you taking to keep clients and nodes from being trolled? What type of authentication do you need? Okay, Trojans. Well. Um, there's the uh, fact that only we have CVS access and um, we're, we're nice guys. Uh, but you really shouldn't trust us. You should uh, audit the code yourself because we might be, we got the, you know, we got some guy from Sweden. <laughs> he seems like a nice guy to me, but I don't know. Um, <laughs> well, he's going to hear that too. All right. So anyway, um, and so there's that. And there's, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, you're downloaded off a central site. Now, um, there's always the ability that someone's going to crack SourceForge and, uh, you know, it's going to mess with things. We're, we're starting with the next release. We're starting to sign the... Um, the uh, release. So, if you've ever gotten a release before, um, or if you, you know, can get our um, public keys off of some place that you, for some reason you trust, I don't know why you trust them. Um, but uh, if you could do that, then you know, you can uh, test to make sure that it's a, it's a valid thing. Um, clients, they're written by a whole bunch of people I don't know, uh, so I I wouldn't trust them basically because I don't know the people that that wrote that code. Um, and uh, okay, authentication with your notes. Um, currently, the um, Authentication between nodes uses a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which means that uh, it's not susceptible to totally passive eavesdroppers, um, but it uh, is susceptible to uh, man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, in the future, uh, not in the next release, I don't think. Uh, yes, not in the next release. Um, we're going to have it where if you want to exchange uh, public keys out of band with a node, then you can. It has to be out of band because you, you can't trust anyone you're talking to until you exchange public keys with them. So you can exchange public keys with a node, like you can like give it to them on a piece of paper or something, and then you you know you now have a trusted public key, or at least a fingerprint. And then uh, then that's that's some good um, public key infrastructure um, between the nodes, and and that's going to be a very uh, nice feature. And I can't wait for that. But uh, I think it's going to be a release feature from now. Let's see nobody over there that hasn't already had a question. New people with questions. Okay. Oh, you have another question. Um, we haven't really done much um, research into that, but. Um, the only problem is that it, it, it does run in Java, which does, uh, you know, use more, um, well, it's not so much that Java uses more CPU cycles, it's that uh, if you have a really old machine, like an Amiga, then you can't find a Java implementation for it, which is so sad, because, I mean, so much for, you know, write once run, anyways, like, write once run on the two operating systems that are supported, that's kind of sad. Um, so, uh, but... From you know, it really doesn't really do all that much. Um, it uh, except for the um, like most of the uh, encryption stuff is done uh, client side. Uh, there's only a little bit of encryption, um, and that's really just the, the key exchange is done um, server side. So you really shouldn't need a lot of, of power. Um, currently, we have a bug where. Uh, when it's actually doing things like trading files and stuff, it uses like 90% of your of your processor power. So um, we probably will have that fixed in the next release. But hey, we're alpha, so I don't have to be sorry. Okay. Um, well, there there were the um, legal restrictions, but they got loosened, and so all we had to do is uh, email some guy in some .gov and say, hey, we we got some crypto, and then that was it. That's the that's the new way. So, yes, yeah, it's cool. Plus, uh, a lot of our developers are in other countries, but that's not so much an issue anymore. Oh, I don't see any more questions. Oh, hey, a question. Um, what are you trying to do to prevent legal <laughs> Ah, that's a good question. Thank you. Yes, legal attacks. Okay, well, um, one of uh, one of the things is, um, and this is, I think, fairly fairly suave um, um, sort of idea. Ian came up with this. Is that uh, all the uh, all the content inside of the network is encrypted. It's encrypted with the plain key, not the hash key. Only the hash key actually gets to the network. That means that the nodes don't actually have the key to decrypt their data. They can't actually read their data. You, uh, wanting to get some information, you of course have the key, because you have to have the key to get the cache to you know, like, go get it. So you have the key, so you can decrypt the data as a user. But all the nodes, they don't know what's on their, their servers. They don't know where it got there. They don't know who put it there. It's just all anonymous and crazy. And so there is some legal precedent that you won't be able to be prosecuted. Now, I'm not a lawyer and nobody really knows. It's just kind of, we just kind of think about it and, you know, looking at the legal precedent, we kind of feel that there's, you can't be prosecuted. But we won't know until someone's actually prosecuted. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we need volunteers. 
And uh, so there's that. Now, some people like to talk about Freenet being made illegal, it being illegal to run a Freenet node. If that happens to us, that's going to be kind of bad. Um, you could still run a Freenet node, but uh, it would be a really big pain because you know you might be arrested. Um, and then there's like steganographic protocols and all that sort of thing, and we're definitely looking into that because you have to have steganography if you want the people in China to be able to use it, as everyone knows. Um, so we're looking into that, but that's, that's, uh, that's in the future. We have a lot of issues before then. Um, Ian just said on the mailing list, Ian Clark, the creator, founder, um, genius behind Freenet who does all the interviews, he, uh, he just said that, um, that Hillary Rosen has said that after Napster, we're next. And so that'll be interesting. But of course, that'll be the Freenet developers being stewed. And I said to Ian, I said, Ian, I told you, when you were talking to Time Magazine, why did you download a Britney Spears MP3? <laughs> now, we have this party line. We're all about stopping censorship. And that's what I talk about. Like, we're here to stop censorship. We're not about trading MP3s. And what do you do? You go and you download MP3s and you say, I don't feel bad because copyright is wrong. I was like, you know, I mean, sure, maybe that won't shut down Freenet, but uh, I'd like to keep working on Freenet. And I can't do that in jail, especially if I'm in jail for, you know, you know having been part of Freenet. I'm rambling. I'm sorry. Okay, next question. <laughs> yes, you there. Oh. The, the client's node, is that encrypted? Yes, yes. Everything's encrypted um, with Diffie Hellman uh, key exchange using um, either Twofish or Ringdial. You have your, your choice because no one can really decide which one's better. Um, yeah, that's all encrypted. All the communication's encrypted. And all of the files in the network are encrypted. Everything's encrypted. So the request itself is encrypted? Yes. Yes, everything, every, all communication over the wire is encrypted in the next version, which is coming out next week. So everyone should upgrade because the current version just isn't nearly as good. Okay, uh, does someone over here have a How question? Long keys? How longer? What do you mean? The, the, the number of bits. When you say key, which of the many things we call keys are you referring to? Crypto key. Okay. Oh, um, I'm not the crypto guy. I think they're um, I think they're 128 bit. But I don't really remember. Scott's the crypto guy. So if you have any questions about crypto, email Scott. If you have any questions about efficiency, email Oscar. If you have any questions about MP3s and child pornography, email Ian. And uh, <laughs> if you if you want to give us mad props, you can email me. Okay, you right there. Right, that's why you need uh, steganography. If you want to hear about uh, encryption not being allowed in certain countries and uh, steganography and that sort of thing, you need to go to peacefire.org or talk to that guy right over there, the peacefire.org guy. That's what he's working on. Um, okay, so you in the white shirt with the glasses and the such. Yes, the issue? Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. In this particular network? Okay. Well, it doesn't send it back. It, the, the request backtracks. It'll then send it to uh, 37. It'll send it to 8. Uh, it'll then backtrack. It'll send it to 13. Then it backtracks. Yeah, that means that. Uh, what? Um, uh, yeah, the message, the message will have the same ID. Uh, messages, uh, error messages inherit the, I, the unique ID from, their, uh, from the message which uh, spawned them. So it's not unique to every message. Uh, well, you know, it can be because like, this is one message and this is another message. But it's, uh, to every message chain, there's a single unique ID. It's like, you know, uh, like the threading, thread ID in, in mail. Anyway, um, okay, yeah, you... Uh, we don't we don't have that in their implementation. We don't have blacklisting or, or any of that sort of stuff. But uh, you could certainly that wouldn't be a problem at all to add. It's just a matter of like a little feature that somebody should come like submit a patch. You could submit a patch. Just get our this, get CVSS, submit a patch would be great. Sign uh, node addresses. Uh, yeah, you could do that. Except that that's only really um, useful if you're discovering n new nodes, which um, I personally think you should reject acts, reject requests to nodes you don't know unless you're running some kind of public uh, service node. But uh, yeah, I mean. Oh no, if you're referring to Christy Nodes, you want it to go in the .gov domain. Because it's not getting it from you, it's getting it from some other random person. Dude, you totally want .gov to have all the MP3s. I'm sorry, all the Zapatista manifestos. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. You're meaning you're wasting hops. It could be going to real nodes when it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, that would... You know, I really think that though, that that, that should be... Um, that should be a node by node thing. That shouldn't be something that when you send the message, you say, okay, this is who I want to get it. I think that the nodes themselves should decide who they want to send it to. But uh, I mean, that's debatable. If you get on the mailing list, we can debate it. That's what we do there. We debate a lot. Okay.
Uh, woo. Nobody has any more questions? Just one more question. Okay, hey. Say I'm trying to download the matrix. Yeah? For example, yeah, that's if I get one, and that's an eight, it's got to go a really long way. Uh, yeah? This, I mean, is, they, is there anything to try and speed this up? Um, well, you can uh, come back in like an hour, and then it'll be one hop away from you, and that'd be cool, you know. Um, yeah, that's a that's the thing. That's a problem because uh, I mean, there's obnoxious people with 28.8 modems in the network, probably, and they're all like slow. You got like a T1, 28.8, a T1, then you're going to 28.8, and that's kind of depressing. But then if you come back later, it'll be on the other side, and you'll be at T1 again. So uh, there you go. All right. Uh, yes. You know, that's something we've been debating, whether or not it should, because uh, if you cancel it in progress, still propagating, that means it's good, because you come back, it'll be cached. But it also means that it's uh, a lot less work uh, to do one of these um, storage uh, denial services, which I'm, I'm saying storage of denial service won't really work all that well, but uh, it does work better with requests, because you request the information, that gives it, that gives it some points, right? Um, so, yeah, we haven't decided. Um, currently, I actually don't remember, because I think we had it one way, and then we switched it some other way, and there's all these people in the code, and so, uh, yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a very good question. Yeah. It uses whatever you want it to use because if you use some particular thing, then well, that would be really easy to block with the firewall. Um, right now, it's really hard to block with firewall because you have to be able to. Your firewall has to know how to like see a Diffie-Hellman key exchange and say, "Oh no, Diffie-Hellman key exchanges, no sir." Um, and uh, so yeah, but the default port is one nine one one four, which I think Ian said spells Ian somehow. <laughs> Um, and the default client port, like not the default, but the one I like to use is 1001. Uh, I think that's, I'm sorry, 10001. That's a good uh, port for clients. Any more questions? No? Okay. Well, um, I guess there's no more questions. I have uh, t shirts, and uh, you should get on our mailing list, and um, you should get on the webpage, and you should download Freenet, and you should attack it, and, um, and, um, and there you go. What? Oh, thanks. <laughs>